Welcome, comrades, to the Spectre of Communism podcast. Two weeks ago, Donald Trump was elected for the second time to the presidency of the United States. And there's lots of talk about what a Trump presidency 2.0 could mean for the state of play in US politics and throughout the world. Fortunately, we've just had the Revolution Festival here in Britain, put on by our comrade of the Revolutionary Communist Party. And amongst the speakers visiting from New York... We have Antonio Balmer, who is a leading member of the Revolutionary Communist of America, the US section of the Revolutionary Communist International. Antonio, it's great to have you. Happy to be here. A specter is haunting Europe. The specter of communism. Communism. Stronger, more determined than ever. Communist. Communism. The communist. The communist. The communist. Dedicated to the establishment of a new art. So, we've had quite a few articles and we've had against the stream episodes dealing with the election of Trump, why it happened, why Kamala Harris and the Democrats were defeated despite the wishes and best efforts of the establishment in the States. And I recommend, if you haven't seen it already, that you check out a recording of Antonio's speech at the Revolution Festival where he talks about Trump's election. But I want to get into something else in this episode, which is the general crisis of liberal bourgeois democracy. When Trump was elected for the first time in 2016, there was a lot of hysteria about this being the end of American democracy, the rise of fascism. And now that Trump is back, those fears and that hysteria has come back um, with a renewed force. But what does Trump's election actually signify? How do we explain it? Well, on the one hand, the ruling class of the United States, as is the case in many parts of the world, they can't rule in the old way. So it is an overthrow of a status quo, in a sense. And the things that were worrying these strategists of the ruling class in 2016, when they were saying that this is dangerous for liberalism and the institutions, uh, particularly the fact that there was mass uh, skepticism about elections, but also about all of the, the media, uh, the, the establishment circles of both ruling parties. They were worried about those things. I think they were starting to tell themselves in 2020 that they had overcome the danger and that Joe Biden's uh, victory you know, signified that Trump's win had been an aberration. Mm. That's what he called it. And this shows that they were wrong. I mean, the Democrats misread the mood of the country severely this year, but this shows that they've also, as a class, you know, the bourgeois liberals are basically the the baseline ideologues of American capitalism, mm. and their worldview has been discredited, and it's not its legitimacy is not coming back. It's mm. actually been mortally wounded, you know, and the ability for them to sell that message to the public. The way it failed uh, in this election cycle is kind of an indication of where things are headed. They were saying, things are great. Everyone should be happy. This is yeah. a campaign of Inflation's joy. Inflation's down. Unemployment is down. Yeah. People are finally starting to feel the benefits of economic recovery. But really, nobody was feeling that. And we'll get into the statistics about the economy later. But just on this question of the legitimacy of the institutions of the ruling class, I've got a few statistics here. From 2022, the World Values Survey, they received data from the USA and the UK, found that the majority of respondents from these countries had not much confidence or no confidence in churches, the press, the government, elections, major companies, and banks. And it also found specifically in relation to the US, a confidence level in 14 major institutions that includes the presidency the supreme court the senate and congress averaged at 27 percent which is the lowest point since 1979 the pew research center did another poll that same year which found that only 24 percent of americans said they could trust the government at least most of the time in 2022, that compares to 73% in 1958. So no matter what way you slice it, there's been a huge collapse of trust in the institutions of American capitalism. And I think it's fair to say that Donald Trump has, to a large extent, capitalized upon that mood. Absolutely. 
it's a it shows that it's also goes far beyond the inflation of the last four years mm. i've seen a lot of you know analysis that sort of tries to sum it up in a short way saying voters care about inflation more than they do about unemployment and trying to boil it down to like oh it's just all a story about inflation it's not it's a story about an, a deep-seated rejection of the system a deep-seated discontent that it's not just about the prices that's maybe something that helped this anger to boil over and it probably did help put trump over the edge but clearly as a phenomenon trumpism and if you like right populism and left populism for that matter they're all a reflection of something that's been shifting beneath the surface for decades mm. and that's what this shows i mean you don't have this kind of skepticism of all of the ruling institutions just pop up it doesn't just happen from from one day to the next it builds up over a long time when people feel that this system is clearly run by a tiny minority the vast majority of us are plunging more and more into misery they don't feel like there's anything on the horizon that's that gives them cause for optimism mm. that's sort of the underlying reality that creates these kinds of attitudes and that's why the liberals and i, I mean that in the sense of the ruling class they're so concerned about where this is going and they're angry at Trump for for whipping it up for tapping mm. for for giving it a a channel you know they would much rather this thing just die die off this kind of sentiment but nothing they do is can produce that result on the contrary the way they're running the system it's actually a, an offshoot of the the capitalist crisis itself mm -hmm. this is a declining system it's been in decline in steady decline for the last half century mm -hmm. And those are the things that create these attitudes towards all the ruling institutions. And now, of course, that for us is a is a good thing that people are awakening to this recognition of all of these institutions represent another class. I don't trust them. The system is rigged against us. This is a step forward in consciousness. In the past, maybe people were more passive or apathetic or or they just had more illusions and trust that the government's going to, you know, as you said, People in the past said, most of the time, I can trust the government to do the right thing or mm -hmm. I can leave it to them. Now, there's just this underlying hatred of, of all governments and all ruling parties. Mm -hmm. And yes, Trump skillfully tapped into that in 2016. He said his campaign, the first time he said his campaign was against the Democratic Party and the establishment of the Republican Party. Mm. So it suddenly, it appeared to people as an outlet for their discontent in a an environment where otherwise there appeared to be no outlet. Mm. You know, there was the Sanders movement, of course. I guess that was the other big outlet. Sure, we'll come to that later yeah. on because that's a key factor in perspectives. But let's think about this discrediting of the system and this anger. We've rightly castigated the um, assessments of the establishment liberals. Some of them are a little bit more farsighted. They tap into certain truths. And I read something interesting by Wendy Brown, who is the UPS Foundation professor in the School of Social Science at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. She says... Trump has been running on an anti-establishment economic position since 2015. Some call this economic populism. It may not be sincere. He has plenty of support from capital and the mega-rich, but it addresses the extreme and growing inequalities in the United States. These, of course, are produced by neoliberal offshoring, outsourcing and union busting, by speculation that sent housing costs into the stratosphere, and by privatization of infrastructure ranging from transportation to higher education. Trump speaks directly to the anger and deprivation deprivation experienced by working and middle class families who cannot afford the cost of living nor see a better future for their offspring. We might have uh, some questions about the, the terminology that she uses and the way that she specifically frames it, but in general I think that this is true. Um, people keep being told that things are getting better in the last couple of years, but no one feels like things are getting better. And certainly since 2008 when you had the financial crash, expressing the organic crisis of capitalism. You had the disastrous military adventures by the US and Iraq and Afghanistan. Since then, you've had COVID, you've had the return of inflation, you've had the Democrats supporting genocide abroad, you've got warmongering in Europe. And all of this has just created such a mood of disaffection and hatred towards the establishment. But something that I'd like you to maybe help our viewers and listeners out with trump is himself a member of the elite right he's a billionaire 
He's got all sorts of connections to the upper echelons of U.S. society. How is it that this guy who is literally a member of the establishment is able to capture an anti-establishment mood? Well, he has quite cynically, but also skillfully tapped into what has essentially been a vacuum in U.S. politics. I mean, I'll say let's we, we should give Bernie Sanders credit where credit is due in 2016 for starting to bring a type of language into the political landscape that didn't exist before. When he did, when he had that campaign in 2015 and 2016, it was unheard of for a politician not only to describe themselves as a socialist, to talk about the working class, but to start bringing this fire against the billionaires, mm. the banks, the corporations. So this is when Bernie Sanders, this democratic socialist, self-described senator from Vermont, ran for the Democratic primary against Hillary Clinton. That's right, yeah. And the way that he ran that campaign, we were against, of course, the fact that he ran as a Democrat, mm -hmm. that being uh, a, the main party of the ruling class in the United States. Mm -hmm. And the fact that that was a mistake, I mean, is confirmed by the way that those campaigns ended up sure. playing out. He should have broken with the Democrats. He should actually have run as an independent right. and explained that the working class needs a party of its own. But the fact that he ran a, a campaign using that kind of language and the response that it got, I mean, it really was it, uh, an earth-shattering event for U.S. politics. And it awakened a whole, I mean, millions of people were were very deeply moved and actually a lot of people that are today the communists that we're encountering left and right in the u.s share a similar origin story and they say mm. i was really into bernie in 2016 or even in 2020 and his betrayal you know the fact that he capitulated repeatedly to the democrats is also a radicalizing thing that pushed people beyond the bounds of that party but we should say trump saw this you know he saw the effect that Bernie's rhetoric was having. Trump's base was a coalition. It's always been a very cross-class mixed group. The Trumpism as a, as a movement has never been a homogenous, one solid reactionary bloc. You have millions of workers who, are, who have illusions in Trump. You have petty bourgeois. And yes, you have far-right people and racists. And you have, there's a lot of, there's a mixed bag there. But a lot of people that voted for Trump they were looking desperately for an alternative, and they also had a favorable view of Sanders. Mm. And I remember anecdotes about crowds that would be shown footage of Hillary Clinton, and they would be booing and jeering, and they saw her as the enemy. She's a, a classic symbol of the establishment. And then when Sanders came up, an image of Sanders, you had a different attitude, silence, respect. People felt like that's another underdog. Mm. A lot of people, a surprising number of people, for those who are looking at this like the Democrats are left and the Republicans are right, they would be surprised by this. But if you're looking at it in class terms, it's not as surprising. A lot of people said either Sanders or Trump mm. for me because I want someone who's going to fight against this system. And that's the thing is that when Sanders capitulated, he ceded the field completely to Trump. He handed him on a platter a monopoly of the anti-establishment rhetoric. Mm. So that's a large part. I mean, we should say Sanders helped create Trump. In the first place, it was the Democrats... It's the capitalist system. It's the policy that, you know, the Democrats have been in power 16 out of the last 20 years. So that's the real source of this view towards the Democrats as representing the ruling class and capitalist decline. But Sanders having opened this door, creating an alternative, creating, whipping up illusions, and then slamming the door shut in 2016 by bending the knee to Clinton in 2020 again. He did it again this time, backing Kamala. You're opening illusions and then you're slamming shut the door on that route. That's part of what creates this um, really favorable situation for Trump to say, I'm the only one. It's me against everyone else. It's me against the banks and the media and the system and the Washington elite. And so that's really, it's, it's kind of despite Trump's own uh, antics and personality. It's kind of the situation that he's been handed. You'll also say, I mean, a lot of Republican voters, if you ask them, they'll say Trump's not a politician. He's different from the rest of them. And that plays a role as well. I mean, you have a certain role played by the, the individual, the fact that he, doesn't, he comes across crass. Uh, he doesn't respect the rules of how politicians normally act. Other politicians are reading teleprompters. Yeah. Kamala Harris certainly didn't seem uh, sincere in, when she, in, in anything that she said. No, it was all very stage managed, all yeah. very robotic. So there's a contrast. Yeah. And a lot of people who are looking for someone to represent their interests are willing to see in Trump someone worth giving a shot to. Yeah, Trump seems like a human being. 
And I'm not saying that with any kind of credit towards the guy. We should be very clear here. We do not support Donald Trump. Donald Trump is a reactionary. He's a gangster. He's a huckster. But the point is, in a distorted way, he expresses a hatred towards a condescending, out-of-touch elite that's provided nothing for it, the vast majority of the American people, but in the absence of a left-wing alternative to provide an actual solution to any of those problems, you've got hucksters and gangsters like Trump who are able to demagogically capture some of that mood. The fact that people are rejecting the capitalist establishment is a good thing from our point of view, and it deserves to be rejected. One more quote that I wanted to draw on, uh, a guy called Ruchia Sama, chair for the Rockefeller International. He wrote a book recently called What Went Wrong with Capitalism, which is quite an interesting title, quite telling. He said of the election, writing in the Financial Times, it's likely the Democrats would have lost even if inflation had not surged under Joe Biden and he had been replaced earlier by a fresher candidate. What's fueling the protest votes, and he characterizes Trump's election as a protest vote, what's fueling the protest vote is an erosion of faith in the economic future. Nine out of 10 Americans born in the 1940s grew up to earn more than their parents. Today, fewer than four in 10 say they expect the same. Homes are less affordable for the young than at any point in living memory. Trust in many institutions is at or near all-time lows, with confidence in the presidency in the low 20s and big business in the mid-teens. So again, it's further confirmation by some of the more far-sighted representatives of the ruling class, actually. I mean, this guy literally is the chair of the Rockefeller International. They can see it. I mean, I've seen Trump's election characterized as a bit of a peasant's revolt, actually. Brexit was characterized in much the same way back in 2016 mm -hmm. in Britain. And we should also say that in the election this time, the Democrats couldn't hide behind the Electoral College because Trump quite decisively won the popular votes. He got 76 and a half million votes, which is the highest ever for Republican candidates. The votes aren't actually entirely counted yet as of the time of recording, but it looks like Kamala Harris dropped something like 7 million votes compared to Joe Biden in 2020 which implies that for millions of Americans, the narrative that she was the lesser evil uh, simply wasn't convincing. Right. We should also say that the total number of eligible voters in the U.S., if you include those who registered and didn't vote and those who could have registered and didn't even bother, it's like 240 plus million people. So it was over 90 million people who sat out the vote. Of course, once again, the plurality is those who don't even bother to show up to the polls because there is an overwhelming sense that neither party is an alternative, neither party represents... The, in fact, there was quotes, there was uh, polls that were carried out in the lead-up to this election. One from last fall uh, was a record result for those who said they don't feel represented by either Democrat or the Republicans, they would rather have a mass alternative to vote for. It was 63% wow. of the population. So when, when the picture of U.S. politics is presented as Democrats versus Republicans you should remember that that's a minority to begin with that rep that feel actually identified with either. In fact, now they've found that uh, a plurality of registered voters identify as independents outright. It's 37% now compared to around 32 or less percent who identify as Democrats or Republicans. Yeah, that's remarkable. And actually, that's something that uh, Sharma from the Rockefeller International reflects on. He says, and I quote, antipathy to big government and big business and the nexus between them has helped spur the rise of what might be called a third force in US politics. While they were a distinct minority as recently as the late 90s, voters who say that they are independents now represent a strong 37% plurality, consistently outnumbering Democrats and Republicans, according to Gallup. So mm -hmm. there you have it. The yeah. vote for none of the above was, in fact, a plurality of voters. Yes, absolutely. And there's also... The, the so-called double haters who express unfavorable views of both, both candidates but still ended up holding their nose and voting for one or the other. Among those, this was by one of the exit polls that was conducted by a lot of the media outlets, mm. they found that double haters supported Trump over Harris by a margin of 55% to 32%. Mm. So for most people that are just looking for an alternative, they hate the two options, but they're going to go with one of them. I mean, if they're not just going to sit out the election as a whole. They're saying, I, I would rather see another four years of Trump than have another four years of the Democrats. And another poll that um, we were looking at earlier this year 
there was one conducted, I think, by the New York Times that found that 69% of the population either wants major changes to the economic and political system of the U.S. or to see it torn down altogether. Mm. I remember this made me think of something that Biden said in 2020. It was in the course of the race when his main opponent was Biden, was uh, Sanders. Mm. Sanders was winning, by the way, overwhelmingly. He was winning all the first... The, the early races were going towards Sanders by huge margins. Yes. Biden wasn't even getting enough votes to uh, qualify for single delegate mm-hmm. in several of these first ones. Well, Sanders was also sweeping the board as far as party donations go from members. If you look at the member donations That's right. in the different states, he was absolutely cleaning house. It was only the super PACs and the the right. big business backers and so on who were lining up behind Joe Biden. That's right. Among young voters, I remember there was margins like two to one, three to one in favor of Sanders. And Biden was in the back of the pack. Eventually, there was this coordinated maneuver where they, they got... Uh, they got six candidates to drop out before Super Tuesday. Yeah. And then they got two more to drop out immediately after. Right. And they all backed Biden. And it was this whole, we need the anti-Bernie focal point. And they thought Biden being a safe pair of hands as a previous vice president would be the conventional choice. So that's what they settled for. Mm -hmm. And when that happened, Biden made a speech. This was before the primaries were called or before they were over. But once the thing had turned in his favor, he made a speech and he said, he said Trump, the, the four years of Trump were an aberration. And he said, Americans don't want a revolution. Mm-hmm. He said, they just want a return towards decency. But if you look at these polls, you look at the last four years and the real mood in society, it's clear they do want a revolution. Mm-hmm. Maybe they're not using that word, but the vast majority of society, if you're saying 69% of voters, they want major changes or to tear down the system, you're talking about a transformation of society is what people are aspiring to. Mm. And they're only finding one candidate who seems to be the one who's offering to tear things down. Yes. And so, yeah, the, the next four years are going to be chaotic. And, you know, we're going to see, <laughs> I, I guess he's going to try tearing things down from the inside. It's not going to be in the interest of the working class, though. Mm. And so it's going to be a, a very powerful learning experience for a lot of people who have illusions. We should also say the illusions don't run that deep. Mm. People are holding their nose opting for Trump over uh, voting the Democrats back in. But exit polls were showing only 51% of of voters trust Trump to handle the economy. Mm -hmm. Only 50% trust him to handle a crisis. If there's another major recession on our hands, people aren't going into this with a lot of confidence to begin with. And that shows you he he can fall very quickly. We could once again, the the Trump 2.0 could end up being even more hated than Biden, if you can believe Mm. that. Because if people have lar- high illusions and they're hoping to get results, when he's promising the world, he's saying, we're going to fix everything. You're going to have an economic boom like you've never seen before. The best paychecks. He's really raising illu- he's gonna He's over-promising. He's going to under-deliver. Mm-hmm. And if that happens in a dramatic way and there's a real contrast between people's expectations and the result, uh, yeah, you're going to have people abandoning the Trump camp and then trying to figure out where else to go. Yeah. And we'll talk later about where communists come in in that regard, but just in terms of the mood in the USA about revolution, Black Lives Matter was a movement that was short of a revolution. However, it did involve 10% of the entire population in street marches. There was majority support for the burning down of a police precinct. There was majority support amongst voters from all camps right behind the movement at one stage and i think it's not an exaggeration to say that in some instances it took on an insurrectionary character if you look at portland for example where obviously for reasons we haven't got time to go into it was cut across and it, it reached a dead end but nevertheless people were basically cleaning out the official state institutions and looking at themselves and saying, well, how can we run society? How can we police our streets? How can we keep ourselves safe? Because we can't trust the uh, the official police and government to do it for us. And after Joe Biden won the election, you had, I think at one stage, something like 40% of voters in America who didn't trust the results at all. They thought that the election had been stolen. There was um, a riot at the Capitol building on January the 6th. You even had a movie released in the last year, uh, which is quite good, actually. I quite enjoyed it. It's called Civil War, about a civil war breaking out 
in the USA. I've seen so many headlines from some of the big bourgeois newspapers, you know, Wall Street Journal and the New York Times, Washington Post, about the threat of a US civil war. I think there was a poll conducted recently that found something like half of Americans and even more young Americans think that a civil war could be on the cards in the next period. Clearly, there is at the very least an insurrectionary mood amongst a big layer of the American population, whether the ruling class likes it or not. So do you think it's possible that Trump could accelerate that process? Do you think that he could... Uh, intensify the polarization of U.S. society. I think it's all but inevitable. Mm. The fact that, there, was, you know, we've been looking at a lot of the exit polls that show what voters were thinking when they were coming out of the voting booth, but there were also polls that conducted just before the election, and some of these were remarkable as well. One of them that was very striking said 76% of people in the lead-up to the election were worried about post-election violence. Mm. That's more than three-quarters of the population. Uh, 66% of registered voters doubted that Trump was going to accept the results in the event of a loss. Mm. There was all kinds of... uh, 73% worried about attempts to overturn election results. So in general, people's attitude towards the electoral system has hit a very... has hit a low point. Now, obviously, the fact that he won clearly, that there was a fast count and not a protracted, messy, contested result, uh, sort of assuaged those fears in the short term. But the fact is that flammable material exists in U.S. society, and it's been building up for a long time. The things that made 2020 and the summer of George Floyd possible, those ingredients have not disappeared. Mm. In fact, they've only accumulated even further. Mm. So there's yes, there's polarization, but I think more so than polarization, there's a deep-seated anger that, again, the liberals have just, it's like a language they can't speak. It's like mm. they're, they're unable to perceive it, they, they struggle to interpret it, and they really cannot channel it or connect with it at all. It's like they're just removed from it, and it, they are physically removed from it. I mean, yeah. we're talking about a class that is concentrated in, in midtown Manhattan skyscrapers and in the financial districts of every major city in the U.S. They don't, they're, they're not in the workplaces. They're not with us in the subway platforms where you're sweating in the summertime and there's a long delay, and you can feel this thick discontent in the air. They're not surrounded by workers who are just struggling to hold down two jobs or who know that if they get really sick, they might not make it to the end of the month. They could go mm. bankrupt. I mean, the concerns that exist among the working class, it really is a separate world yes. from the people who are doing these, the columnists of the New York Times and the Financial Times. I mean, it's like you have this class distinction and there's an unbridged, there's, a, there's, there's no bridge between them in terms of... Uh, you know, one going from one world to the other. Yes. Now, Trump is playing a dangerous game by talking to this world from the other side, and he's trying to play with this sentiment. But it, it's a dangerous game from the perspective of the ruling class because he's really undermining the legitimacy of that. By, by choosing to deny the election result in 2020, he made a move that was good for his career. It was good for his chances in 2024. But that by doing that... that that very act of saying this election has been stolen when obviously he knew it wasn't stolen. So did all of the Republican um, congressmen and senators who backed this election denial position. They all knew it wasn't a stolen result. Whatever small irregularities you had, it was, it was a pandemic that was going on, but it wasn't a difference of millions and millions of, of votes. Mm. So, but by doing that, he created a result where a majority of the Republican party voters believe that the last four years have been presided over by an illegitimate government. Mm. And, you know, there used to be a consensus among the ruling class that you don't do things like that. Mm. You don't undermine the rules like that because what is that? What is the signal you're sending to millions of people? It's something like 70, 80 million people who, who believe this thing was stolen. You're sending the signal that if this is an illegitimate government, then you're in your rights to depose it, to mm-hmm. take up arms against it. And... If something like the assassination attempt that we saw this summer in Butler, Pennsylvania, if that had led to killing Trump, then the result could have been total chaos in the streets. You could have had a mass uh, riots, you yeah. know. I know that we, we ran an article saying it was an inch from civil war. 
whether that was a spark of an all-out civil war or an acceleration of this path in the direction of sporadic violence, political violence across the country, is kind of beside the point. The point is they're playing with this dangerous thing mm. by stoking anger and not giving it a channel that's going to lead to any improvement in people's lives. Mm -hmm. So the ruling class is worried about it. Um, you know, all of these comment, uh, the, the strategists that write these columns worrying about the the death of liberalism i think for us it's not it's not that trump is any kind of a progressive phenomenon and such it is a totally reactionary phenomenon but he's tapping into something that could be progressive right the anger is 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 a positive thing it's like an awakening of class consciousness and i think that actually what's happening is class is roaring back into u.s politics it's coming to the surface and it's some it's an element that's been on the sideline or has been ignored for for decades when's the last time you had class politics in the u.s that was very clear the 1930s probably yeah it was the era of the great depression mm -hmm. and we're kind of living in a period that's more that has more parallels to a period of total collapse and misery that's another surprising thing about the exit polls is people are saying they feel like their lives have gotten worse more people say their lives have gotten worse over the last four years than the number of respondents who said that in the immediate aftermath of 2008 so while the democrats are saying things are great most people feel like they've just been through a devastating recession, an era of depressions and crises and wars and revolutions. Mm. I mean, you really, we've drawn that parallel before, and I think it's just becoming more and more accurate with every passing day. Mm. Well, let's concretize this with some of the facts that show the gap between these ivory tower columnists and the real living reality for millions of Americans. Uh, mortgage rates have reached their highest level in 20 years. House prices have risen to record levels. Motor and health insurance premiums have rocketed. 40% of Americans, according to Harris Poll for Bloomberg News, said that their household relied on additional income to make ends meet, so a, a side hustle. 38% said the extra money barely covered their monthly expenses with nothing left over. And 23% said it wasn't enough to pay the bills. This is the reality. And on top of that, you've got the years of the pandemic that completely threw huge layers into precarity that upended the status quo for tens of billions of people. And now you've had back-to-back -back conflicts in Ukraine and in the Middle East that America has been directly involved in financing and facilitating. And I think that we should come back to the question of how the Democrats lost, because this was considered to be their election to lose. Most pollsters thought that Harris would take this, albeit narrowly. What can we say of the Democrats' last stint in power? What's the legacy of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris? Well, the fact that they presided over the worst cost of living crisis in 40 years is obviously the, the sort of headline I mean, it's also in the context of what, what are the Democrats associated with? What are the previous Democratic administrations? For eight years, Obama, along with Joe Biden, presided over what has gone down in the history books as the longest, weakest, jobless recovery in history. So it was like the 2008 crisis, really that was the historic turning point. It was devastating. I mean, 10 million people lost their homes, mm. their savings, their livelihood, their jobs. It was like... It was a lot of people's plans for their lives were upended mm. by that by that event. I remember that I, I was living and I was in uh, high school at the time. This affected people deeply. But what happened was years later, it's been four years, five years, eight years. People didn't feel like there was any recovery. There was mm. no improvement. And so that's what the Democrats have been associated with. Go back even further to the Clinton administration. It's 30 years ago, Bill Clinton signed NAFTA. Mm. So all of this devastation in the Rust Belt and the deindustrialization, there were 6 million industrial workers who, those jobs have disappeared and have not come back. Yeah. That was in the early 2000s. That's, yeah, one of the key things that Trump promised was to bring them back, actually. Right, right. So the Democrats are correctly, understandably, associated with a lot of this devastation. And they are the party. They have also become the party of the ruling class. It's like, because Trumpism has usurped the, Democrat, the, the Republican Party against the wishes of the old establishment, he's in effect overthrown the George Bush dynasty, the, the McCain's, the Romney's. The, this is no longer their party. At the Republican National Convention this summer, 
there was basically nobody who spoke at the convention, no one who took the stage who was a pre-2016 leader of the party. It's all been changed. And so people feel that this is now a representation of something new, at least the, those who have illusions in Trumpism. The Democrats, meanwhile, I remember there was a statement by Chuck Schumer, the, the Senate Majority Leader under the Democrats, and he said, for every blue-collar Republican that we lose in western Pennsylvania, we're going to gain two moderates in the suburbs of Philadelphia. And you repeat that in Ohio. They were so smug. Yeah. They thought, oh, this is going to be fine. Let those angry workers go to the Republicans. We're just going to win over the moderates, and we're going to become the party of everybody else. And that's the way they campaigned. Mm -hmm. On top of that, they had this very, obviously, the tone depth, like, let's have a big party. The DNC was just this revolting uh, celebration of joy and all of these pop stars and celebrities, and they got Beyonce, and they yeah. got just... When I saw Eminem, I knew it was over. Yeah, yeah, it's like... You can't come back from that. You want to have a big celebration while people are saying, I can't feed my children, you know? Mm. And the Democrats are saying, I'm happy. Like, the Democrats yeah, are Kamala smiling Harris again. Brat. Yeah, oh, yeah. I think people, I think that also really helped. I mean, it's like, what the last thing you want to do if you're feeling angry is see someone come in and start dancing and singing. Yeah. You see know? some rich pop what... star, some billionaire pop star That's right. talking about how great things are. Yeah, and of course, there was that interview. I mean, that was also a very damaging moment. She said... She was asked, is there anything you would do differently from Biden over the last four years? And you would have thought that a campaign like that would have anticipated a question like this and prepared a different answer. She said, nothing comes to mind. So just like that, that may have been the right. moment where people are like, okay, so it's four well, between, more years of this. Between nearly starting World War Three, between facilitating a genocide in Gaza, between overseeing a massive rise in inflation exacerbated by the war in Ukraine that you are the primary financial facilitator of. Nothing you do differently. Nothing. Perfect. Perfect record. Right. No notes. Right. And the, the hatred towards the Democratic Party in society is probably at, at its highest level ever. Right. And deservedly so. Exactly. I mean, that's, that's for us one of the reasons that like the, the, the media is controlled by the bourgeoisie in the United States. And the dominant ideology among that wing is liberalism. Mm -hmm. And they're worried and they're painting this like a, a, a shift to the right. We're looking at it and we're saying that's not, that's not what's going on. Mm. It's a shift towards anger. It's an expression of anger. It's not a shift towards the right. It's a shift towards the only option that they see to burn the system down. Mm. Now they're going to see how Trump approaches this task over the next four years. Sure. And when he doesn't, there was another, this is another quote um, that I, I wanted to mention. This was from the Wall Street Journal. Um, that says new fault lines are emerging in American society based more on class than race. Mm. This shift helped deliver the White House to Donald Trump and could continue to alter the political landscape if more Americans identify themselves less in the context of race and gender and more as belonging to a certain economic class. That's really the story of, of the 2020s. That's what's happening in society. Mm. People aren't going for identity politics. The influence of this perspective is fading. It's yes. losing its appeal. But in place of it, something is roaring forward. It's class anger. Right. And there's, only, there's, there's, um, there's a scarcity of political forces that are speaking to it, mm -hmm. that are trying to tap into it and give it a, a, an expression and organize it. And the fact that Sanders, again, he started to and then he failed... It really just it was just like a gift to Donald Trump. Yeah, it's really interesting because on the one hand, the Democrats presented Kamala Harris in contrast to Trump. She's a woman of color and she's a bit younger. She pitched more and more right as the election went on, actually. A big section of the Democratic establishment and also the liberal punditry have seemingly drawn two conclusions from this outcome. One, that the Democrats weren't right-wing enough, that they were too woke, they spoke too much about abortion and not enough about kicking out migrants. But they also, on the one hand, um, while spending the last period using identity politics to try and weasel their way into the White House again, they started turning on sections of the population that they said betrayed them. They said that it was down to Muslim voters in Michigan not knowing what was good for them and not supporting Harris as the lesser evil. And now they're going to see what Trump does to Gaza and that'll teach them, that'll show them. They said that it was Latino men being too put off by um, abortion rights. They said that it was white women. They said that it was men under the age of 30 who were just blindsided by right-wing podcast hosts. 
they blame everyone but themselves. They blame everyone but their own appalling campaign and the discredited system that they represent. That's right. At the DNC, aside from all of this partying and celebrities and the pop music, they also there was a lot of flag waving. There was chants of USA. There was a doubling down on, on defense of Israel's uh, right to defend itself. Basically, mm-hmm. uh, the warmongering rhetoric has continued. So they were pitching to the right, and a lot of young people who were hoping that Kamala was going to be a contrast to Biden were then disappointed, and they, they felt like, well, this is more of the same. In fact, I don't recognize this. This looks like the Republican Party from 10 years ago. There was that. But then I know that there's been a lot of uh, commentators out there talking about the role of different minority groups. I think they're kind of stuck in the, the previous mm. uh, perspective. A lot of more insightful um, analysts in, in the ruling class, they're seeing that their story was wrong this uh, opinion piece by David Brooks in the New York Times. It's, it's entitled, Why We Got It So Wrong. Mm. And the whole thing, it starts out saying, electing a black woman to run for president should have got a better result with black voters. And uh, running against someone who was in favor of mass deportations should have done better with Latino voters. And having a woman should have done better with women and all of this stuff. And he was saying that view was wrong. Mm. And this is, this is something that we need to sh- throw out our old perspective. Anyway, I think it's, it is a major, objectively, it's a defeat for identity politics. And it yeah. also shows, I mean, the Democrats, they really were not leaning into identity politics the way Clinton was. Mm. If you remember in 2016, a huge part of her campaign is vote for me because I'm a woman. Sure. We're going to bl- break the, cla- the, the, the glass ceiling. And I, I think that consciously, they didn't want to fall into that same thing. It didn't work the first time. So they're moving away from it. But the thing is that, yeah, that's breaking down. That no longer explains it. But there's something better that's coming in, pre- in place of that. Mm. There's a class analysis. That yes. It's, it's forcing its way onto the forefront. And these analysts are forced increasingly to talk about it and to look at it. And this really makes us arrive at a period. That America is becoming more class conscious. It's happening mm. in a distorted way. Trumpism is like a Frankenstein monster distortion of class rage mm. it's what happens when it's it finds no left-wing expression sure and so and then he is very cynically but also very skillfully associating people's class anger with immigration with china with you know simply the role of the the democrats and then tying the democrats into the left everybody except the capitalist system of course if you had a force that were systematically saying the reason your wages are low and falling and the reason that your standard of living is far worse than your parents and your grandparents is because we live under a system that's dominated by a tiny handful of billionaires that is in decline, that has exhausted its ability to move society forward and did so long ago. I mean, it wouldn't, Trump wouldn't have a monopoly on class anger to begin with. Mm-hmm. But secondly, you could start to give channel this behind a revolutionary program of class struggle, class mm-hmm. war. And the fact that the labor movement is just cravenly pathetically uh, groveling before the Democrats, using all of their resources, the labor leaders have really discredited themselves for a long time. Yes. But they've just clinged to, to the Democratic Party. And now they're discrediting themselves while their their base is saying they're going towards Trump in certain cases among industrial workers like the Teamsters. I mean, this was really a shameful role that the leadership of the Sean O'Brien, you know, tries to present himself as like, I'm not like the other labor leaders. I'm a little bit different. But how did he express that? By going and addressing the Republican National Convention, flirting with the right wing. Mm. And basically the majority of Teamsters now think more of Trump than they do of the Democrats. Well, mm. I guess that's the, the result when those are the two options that you're given. And also this comes off the back of a certain revival of the U.S. labor movement after decades of dormancy. In 2021, you had Striketober, where I think it was 100,000 workers over the course of October of that year were on strike. You had John Deere workers, you had workers in the food production industry, um, you had teachers, you had actors, you had quite a broad section of society from industrial all the way through to, if you like, people working in the cultural sector. And it was basically a response to the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic and the rise of inflation. People were told for a number of years, well, we have to suffer through this unique 
crisis that affects us all equally, a virus that we can't control. But once we come out of that, then everybody will benefit from a roaring 20s. Remember, they were promising promising us. It was roaring, but not quite in the same way that they'd hoped, I think. And then as soon as the restrictions were lifted, people went back to work. The bosses had massively enriched themselves, particularly in the tech sector. But everybody else has to swallow effectively pay cuts. But that's what inflation means. If your wages are worth... 10, 11, 12% less, that's a pay cut. So people used the trade unions. They entered into the elementary bodies of struggle available to the working class, and they went out on strike. They even won certain concessions, so there were some partial victories. Um, Joe Biden, we should say, often touted as a pro-Labour president, but the guy used an executive order to cut across a national rail strike, supported by quite a few of the squad, including um, Alexander Ocasio-Cortez, and later on gave an $8 billion loan to Amazon to cut across a strike by Amazon workers. So you had all this potential. You know, we talk about a distorted reflection of the rise of class consciousness. This was a direct and healthy expression of class consciousness. And the Labour leaders completely squandered it, completely squandered it. And we've said before, the crisis of capitalism is also a crisis of reformism. You talked about how Sanders failing to connect with this mood um, basically laid the groundwork or helped lay the groundwork for Trump. Right after Trump was confirmed as the winner of the election, Bernie Sanders, who spent the last four years um, serving as a left cover for the Democrats while they've carried out these anti-worker policies at home and these genocidal and warmongering policies abroad, he comes out and says, it should come as no great surprise that a democratic party which has abandoned working class people would find the working class has abandoned them. While the democratic leadership defends the status quo, the American people are angry and want change. Great. Where was this, Bernie, for the last four years? For that matter, where was this for the four years prior to that. This is the equivalent of saying, and another thing, after you've lost an argument four hours ago. This is pathetic. And this is what allows demagogues like Trump, I refer the term demagogue to the you know the bourgeois uh, term populism. This is what allows them to capture this mood. They're handed it on a plate by these craven reformists. That's right. The AOC in particular has become the biggest cheerleader not just, for, I mean, for, for, for Biden, everything that Pelosi needed her to do. Mm, she was Nancy Pelosi, she, head of the Democratic National Convention. So the, the head honcho of the Democratic Party, basically. Right. She ran saying she was going to be a force, a different force, a rebellious mm. force in Congress. And the Democratic Socialists of America, which experienced a period of growth after the 2016, mm. the end of the Sanders campaign, they kind of, they were sent on a wave of growth as a section of young people wanted to get organized Basically, they saw the door slam shut. They wanted to continue the, San- sure. the Sanders movement. They started running campaigns, but they did it the same way that Sanders did. They committed the same mistake, mm. running as Democrats on the Democratic platform, calling that the only practical option in the two-party system. Yeah. And so what happened actually in practice when these people get elected, AOC becomes the biggest cheerleader for, these, for the establishment, the biggest defender. When Biden was at his low point after the debate, if you remember, in was it in June that he had that initial debate, which really started precipitating all well, the of the rest of this? The one where he was, his brain was absolutely fried, and he couldn't string two words together. That's the one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the worst presidential performance yeah. in a debate. It was crazy watching all of the main representatives of the most powerful imperialist country in the world very visibly going, oh my God, yes. what are we going to do? This is, these this are the options. Cooked. The, the largest imperialist force in the world. And these are the options for who's going to be at the helm of it. I mean, it really was quite a spectacle, and it made a big impact on people. But while the Democratic strategists, they were in panic mode, the red signs are flashing, we got to solve this, we got to get somebody else in, Mm -hmm. AOC comes to Biden's defense and says, no, you can't switch, you can't look for another candidate, he can't step down, he's got to run. It would be perilous perilous if he steps down. So Alexander, the guy can't speak, let alone run. That's right, but she's very loyal. And she said, you know, this is the most successful president in modern U.S. history. That was her take on on Joe Biden. I mean, it's like from another world. What world is she living in? But this is the role that that when you have, when you run as a Democrat, you get elected, you just, you're susceptible to all the pressure of a party that belongs, it's an institution of the other class. Sure. And that's what these socialists really have not understood. Mm. 
the what they should be doing, what what everyone on the left should actually have been doing is explaining, telling the truth. Yes. Neither party represents the working class. The workers are the vast majority. There's actually a majority of the population that doesn't feel represented by either class. We should be organizing them into a new mass force. Mm -hmm. The labor movement has still millions of people, huge resources that they're throwing away for the Democratic Party. Yes. Rather than channeling it all into the so-called lesser evil, they need to be laying the groundwork for the only thing that will uh, amount to a step forward in in the class struggle in the United States. Yeah, I mean, Sanders could have done that. He could have done that years ago. He could have done that in 2016. I mean, in, right. in this country, for a generation, generation or, or two, you had two main parties, the Tories and the Whigs, the Tories and the Liberals, who fought it out in government back and forth. The Whigs were presented to... The working class as it develops and the poor as the lesser evil you know they were basically the the enlightened wing of the capitalist class whereas the Tories represented the most reactionary elements the big landlords and and so on but eventually there was a labor party established in britain notwithstanding where it's gone these days but yeah. it was a big step forward at the time and within only a decade or so, it had more or less wiped the liberals off the map, and they were relegated to third place, and they would never recover from that. Yeah, and that success depended on them arriving at a position of class independence. That's right. right. There was an initial, there was a, a blurry moment when they were still had the the lib labs, right, the yeah. liberal labor, and they were kind of yeah. There was a wing of the party that wanted to remain connected to the liberals. Right. That's basically the dominant force on the soft left in the United States mm -hmm. has that perspective. We need to run workers' candidates or socialist candidates on the Democratic Party, rather than saying we need to break with that institution and build something new. So yeah. that's it's a long-standing debate, but I think events are helping to clarify that because how has that worked out? I mean, now we can draw a balance sheet after the experience of 2016, 2020, 2024. Yeah. Four years from now, I'm sure people are still going, the broken record's still going to be spinning about yeah. we need to vote for the lesser evil, but a lot of people have had it. Yeah. And so it... It is. It does take events for people to draw conclusions, and I think that's actually happening very rapidly. Yeah, I agree. I think that hopefully the experience of the last couple of years means we can finally bury the lesser evil arguments 20 feet under with a stake through its heart. I think lesser evilism will be around until the revolution itself, but... It's part of part. Of these political battles are definitely the way that the revolutionary forces are forged. Well, no, it'll remain because liberals will say that the reaction is the lesser evil to the revolution that's right they'll say the counter-revolution is the lesser evil anyway um let's talk about the lessons to come let's talk about what happens from here let's start domestically trump's cabinet picks make sense of this for us um because it's it's an eclectic bunch to say the least you've got uh, elon musk at the head of doge the department of government efficiency promising to take a chainsaw to um all these different federal departments but you've also got matt gates right um the alleged child sex trafficker um you've got some of the most hawkish representatives of the trump faction of the gop in key positions in terms of defining america's foreign policy going forward trump himself we said before has an isolationist instinct for the most part, and he has said a number of times he's going to try and call time on the war in Ukraine so that he can focus more on China, which he sees as the main enemy. What's a Trump presidency going to look like this time around, do you think? Chaos. Cool. I think it's going to be four years of total chaos. Yeah. And I think it's going to actually be more chaotic than the first four years. There was a section of the ruling class that was starting to warm up to Trump, mm -hmm. I think out of desperation because they were so, the, the, the Democratic option was so untenable for them. They said, well, this is the reality that's coming. Maybe it won't be so bad. Mm -hmm. After all, the, the country's still standing after the first term. So maybe we can deal with it. I remember Michael Bloomberg himself, yeah. one of these billionaire candidates for the Democrats uh, in 2020, was uh, he wrote an op-ed recently and he said, you know, Trump wasn't my first pick. I wanted Kamala, but he won fair and square. So we need to work with him. We need to curb his excesses this time around. And that was kind of like you were seeing a little, like a little, they wanted to have a bit of optimism that mm. things might not be so bad. And then immediately after the election, Trump has this flurry of announcements of all of these cabinet picks. And I think 
those that wing of the ruling class must be clutching their heads right now yeah thinking that this is this is going to be four years of you have a collision course actually trump is on a collision course with his own federal apparatus mm. he's appointing people based on loyalty and i think to some extent it's like a loyalty test mm. how far can he go he's got there's moderates in the senate he needs the senate approval and he's got a pretty slim majority mm. so he needs them to be on board with what he's doing in some ways maybe this is a test for those moderates mm. to see if they're going to side with trumpism and to what extent they're willing to give trump a blank check which could actually hurt them because if they're from mixed uh, there there are areas of the electorate that don't want to see their representatives just giving trump a blank check it could hurt them he may be betting that he could have even more support it's possible that that's kind of another option is maybe he could be tying his hands you know he could be up hoping that he's going to actually lose a majority and then he has something to blame because as you know the whole trick of Trumpism is a blame game. Yes. It's, you know, it wasn't me presiding over the crisis. It was China that created the pandemic. We had a wonderful economy. It's mm -hmm. the immigrants. It's not. So he always needs something to blame. It's possible that that could be where this is going. But either way, you're going to have, yeah, he's appointing people that are threatening purges. If they do lay off tens of thousands of civil servants, that's going to plunge the federal government into more chaos because mm. you do need people to do jobs in order for this machine to work. Mm. And if you you swap out, you know, tens of thousands for inexperienced uh, Trump loyal mm. people, it's going to create a lot of chaos for the federal government. But they're also on a collision course with their own ruling class and their their military establishment. I mean, probably one of the most shocking has been this pick for the head of the Pentagon. The Secretary of Defense is going to be, according to Trump, Pete Hegseth. Mm. This is the host of Fox and Friends. It'll be the first time in U.S. history that you have a, a pick like that with zero government experience. He was in the military, but he wasn't at a high level. He was a guard at Guantanamo. Mm. He, had, he was deployed in Iraq and Afghanistan. This isn't somebody that's... Now, to think someone like that, who's very friendly and gratuitous to Trump on his Fox News uh, slot, to think that a 2.1 million personnel Department of Defense is going to be headed up by a Fox News host has got military officials like speechless. And again, this is kind of, yeah, it's going to be a loyalty test, but it's also something that all of the, the, all of the process we're discussing about the falling, de the decline of legitimacy in these institutions, the fall of respect for them, the loss of like any kind of, uh, you know, people used to have a certain reverence for mm. these institutions you know it's the u.s government the most powerful in the world it's all in it's all in fast decline and i think four years from now those polls about how many people trust these institutions will be far lower even i mean it's not going to change their fortunes but one thing we should say you know as, as wacky as trump's picks have been i remember kamala was making this argument that this is the most important election in our lifetimes because the fate of democracy is at stake well what democratic institutions with a small d are we talking about here are we talking about free speech because it wasn't trump who was sending national guardsmen and police to tase and beat up and tear gas student protesters peacefully opposing their institutions support for israeli genocide all over the country it was under the democrats that that right. occurred um it's tim not... waltz was the governor of minneapolis of there minnesota during the the 2020 summer so he yeah. was the one sending in those national guards to go in and brutalize people right and it wasn't trump that was um dragging the world ever closer to the nightmare of nuclear war over ukraine it's joe biden and literally as as far as i can tell a final act of spite joe biden has just given the ukrainians given zelensky the green light to use attackums long-range missiles deep in Russian territory. Literally, as we were about to record, those missiles were soaring through the air towards Russian territory. Yeah. Um, He's also given Trump another gift because it's Trump once again can say, here you have the role of the Democrats who want to provoke violence and wars around the world, these yeah. warmongers. And now Trump is able to make that case based on Biden recklessly using this last minute policy. Sure. And and it's a war that no one supports, or rather that majority of Americans don't support. The polls reflect this. And then of course you have the Middle East. 
the majority of Americans do not support what Israel is doing in Gaza. They don't support their taxpayer dollars being used to blow up schools and hospitals and mosques and murder thousands of innocent children and unarmed civilians. They don't want another Middle Eastern catastrophe. So what democratic institutions are we talking about here that apparently Kamala Biden and the Democrats defend that Trump opposes because it's not free speech. It's not the right to choose the policies that you want. It's not the right to peacefully protest. It's not the right to be guaranteed a future free from the specter of nuclear war. So what exactly are people supposed to be defending when they cast their ballot for supposedly the lesser evil? That's a good question for them. (laughs) (laughs) There's there's nothing that, yeah, I I mean, precisely that's the, the point is that People don't feel represented by the system. It was actually one of these exit polls found that um, 25% of the population feel democracy is secure. 73% feel it's threatened. A New York Times poll from earlier this year said 49% think it does a good job of representing the, uh, the population. 45% says it doesn't do a good job. There is like a widespread indifference. And it's a, a marked change between... 50 years ago, or Mm. say at the height of the post-war period, when you would have had the vast majority of people having, again, uh, a sense that these are sacred institutions, Mm. the the Constitution, there was respect that people felt like these at at least represented our will or we can vote and that matters. Now the majority, especially the majority of young people, Mm. I think it's uh, two-thirds who say it doesn't matter who gets elected. It doesn't change anything. Mm. And that's, in effect, the sentiment of most of the working class yes. as well. There's uh, poor workers and workers in, uh, poor people in uh, Detroit, uh, black families in these segregated neighborhoods that the Democratic um, campaigners were trying to get to vote for Kamala were repeatedly saying, nothing's going to change. Why should I go out and vote? And they thought they would have it in the back because of their identity politics perspective. Yeah. But it's people aren't uh, convinced by this anymore. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And just to bring this to a close, I've seen some bright sparks in the Democratic establishment and the liberal punditry suggesting that what the left, by which they mean the liberals, really need is a Joe Rogan, a liberal Joe Rogan, As a headline in the New York Times put it, Trump's win leaves Democrats asking, where are our bro whisperers? The argument basically being that the problem is Donald Trump can mobilize support from all these alternative news sources on social media, you know, Joe Rogan's podcast and the Tate Brothers and Turning Point USA and all these characters, whereas the Democrats just don't have that comms game and they aren't tapping into the... Uh, the way that the modern voter consumes the news. Yeah. Well, first of all, it's not surprising to hear the liberals have a, an interpretation of this like that one. I mean, they've they've constantly looked at this as a very in a very superficial way. Yeah. When they're analyzing the polarization and the anger in society, they frequently say they blame it on social media. They blame it on Trump's rhetoric. Mm. They don't understand the underlying process that's actually giving rise to the shift towards class anger that's happening the result of the last 50 years of capitalist decline. So it makes sense that they would say, well, we're playing the game in a way. We're not playing the game well enough. You know, we need to play it better like the Republicans are. The truth is that anger is real. Mm. The anger that the liberals can't speak to, can't understand, can't explain, it's real. It's a real force. Mm. And it's a progressive force. It's class anger that's coming forward. And it's a response to precisely the decline of capitalism. And what, what is needed is for someone on the left, a force on the left, to have the backbone that so far only Donald Trump has shown. Mm. We've seen Sanders play with this sentiment and then uh, disappoint it. He has no backbone. Mm. He's got, he doesn't have something. What you need, actually, is ideological consistency. Mm. That's where the backbone comes in. This is why Lenin said that without revolutionary theory, there can be no revolutionary movement. In the end... The only chance you have of withstanding those kinds of pressures and always remaining firm and consistent in the face of this onslaught from the enemy class is to have a worldview that's consistent. Mm. And that means materialism. It means dialectics. It means the the ideas of Marxism. 
that's the thing that's missing on the left. Mm -hmm. There is a force that's training people on that basis systematically across the U.S. and around the world. It's the Revolutionary Communists International and the Revolutionary Communists of America. Mm -hmm. So we're doing precisely what's required because if you have a network of cadres, of trained revolutionary uh, professional activists, professional uh, agitators, propagandists, people who can explain ideas and give answers, now you have precisely the force that can connect with that anger. Mm -hmm. It can't be just done haphazardly. It needs to be done in a systematic way, which is exactly what we're dedicated to in, in the Revolutionary Communists of America. Mm. Well, that was such a good note to end on. I won't even contest the pronunciation of the word Kader because I completely agree with the sentiment and I know that the comrades of the Revolutionary Communists of America are doing a fantastic job. Clearly you're tapping into something because you've even scared the hell out of the likes of Elon Musk. I see he's been sharing some videos of our marches in Pittsburgh and elsewhere. He's a big fan. He's a big fan of our work. And um, no, in all seriousness, I think that this is the point. There is no version of liberalism that is able to tap into the mood that exists today because ultimately it's just a friendlier face on a system that's already failed to provide for people. It's been discredited because what it's trying to sell is a system that's past its sell-by date and can't provide a dignified existence to the majority of working and poor people in America or anywhere else. But our ideas can provide a road forward. A road forward that Donald Trump cannot provide, because in spite of the way that he poses himself as this anti-establishment figure, he's going to drain the swamp, he's going to bring back the jobs, he's going to reshore American industry and this sort of thing. He won't do any of those things. He can't do any of those things, because he also represents that system. Only a fundamental break with capitalism is capable of breaking the impasse that is resulting in all of the problems that we see today. You know, the war, the instability, the economic chaos, the precarity. And, and all, all of that instability, those same things that are producing this anger that Trump is tapping into, those are the same factors that are also pushing people in the direction of communism. Right. And there's nothing to stop those factors from exerting their effect. It's going to actually intensify under Trump over the next four years. Yeah. The things that are producing communists by the millions in the United States they're going to actually ramp up their production in the coming years. So yeah. it's never been a better time to be a communist, actually. Well, if you are a communist in the USA and you're not yet organized with the Revolutionary Communist of America, then do get in touch. I'll put links to the American Comrades website in the description of this episode. If you're based anywhere else and you agree with what you've heard today or anything else that we've produced on this show or on our main website, marxist.com, then reach out to the Revolutionary Communist International and you'll find a way to speak to a communist near you. Antonio, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I'll see you all next week. A specter is haunting Europe. The specter of communism. Communism. Stronger, more determined than ever. Communist. Communism. The communist. The communist. The communist. Dedicated to the establishment of a new order. Just what is communism? I'll guarantee that ten minutes from now, a lot of you are going to have a new understanding of communism. <laughs>